that when we launched our virtual program 325 days ago, we'd still be in lockdown now an astonishing 11 months later. And that would be the backdrop in which JLGB would mark its 125th anniversary. But as we look back now over 101 episodes later, not only have we been nominated for this year's Children and Young People Now Awards, but this year it was also the year Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, agreed to become our patron. But tonight, we look towards the future with a member of the London Assembly and one of the London candidates for mayor. Tonight, we are joined by British politician Sean Bailey. Born in North Kensington in 1971 to a British Jamaican family, Sean earned a degree in computer-aided engineering from London South Bank University. He then worked for over 20 years as a youth worker. He ran a charity and was a researcher for the Centre for Policy Studies where he wrote several articles in the British press. Joining the Conservatives, he served as David Cameron, the Prime Minister, his special advisor on youth and crime from 2010 to 2013. In May 2016, he was elected as a member of the London Assembly and in 2018, he was selected as the Conservative candidate in the London mayor elections, which were originally scheduled for May 2020, but postponed until May 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. JLGB is of course a non-political charity, but we wanted to give the young people the chance to put questions to the candidates in the upcoming London mayor elections, including the current mayor Sadiq Khan, who will join us in just a few weeks. But today, to hear about all of his aspirations for London, we are grateful that Sean has found the time to speak to us this afternoon. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this afternoon's very special guest, Sean Bailey. Welcome, Sean. How are you? I am fine. Excuse me, I'm just unmuting myself. I am fine. I'm in fine fettle. I've had a good day and I'm ready to answer some questions. Perfect. So we are incredibly pleased to have you here tonight, this afternoon, sorry, on our JLGB virtual programme. We've been boosting positivity and keeping children and their families happy, active and healthy and entertained for a solid 45 weeks since the first lockdown began last March. And now more than 100 episodes later, we've been viewed online by nearly 3 million people, thanks to the help of a special guest like you every evening. So why was it important for you to join us this afternoon? Firstly, let me say congratulations with your activity. It is a, it's a testament to who you are as an organisation that you fought to do this and then you've had such success. So I, I, I congratulate you on that. Why I'm here really is because at heart I'm a youth worker and one of the biggest pieces of youth work I've ever done was I was a member of the Army Cadets Association, another um, um, uniformed group of young people. I was a member for over 14 years, both as a young person and as an adult instructor. I then went on and became an honorary colonel to the Army Cadets as well. So I, I've always enjoyed, you know, organised, structured um, youth, youth activities. I just think it's a wonderful thing. I think you learn so much for your, for your social goings on. So I thought, why not? It's a great invite. I'd love to speak to young people. So I'll come here. And plus, when you've been doing politics like I have, let's just say I've been in a lot of long boring meetings it's quite good to come into a, an exciting meeting so that's why I'm here. Well hopefully this meeting can be just as exciting and maybe a bit more exciting than some of those longer calls. So as you've heard we are all about acts of kindness here at JLGB. We always ask our guests what they've been doing to help others. Now of course you have been involved in supporting many charities and campaigns throughout your life but is there a particular personal act of kindness that you've done during this pandemic to help others? Um. I, I, I tell you, let me tell you about the personal act of kindness that I've seen that I've respected the most. When you're running for Mayor of London, one of the greatest things is you get to go around and meet lots of people. And I've been to a number of charities that sprung up just out of the grassroots in, in response to COVID-19 and the outbreak. So, for instance, I went to a restaurant in Alperton, uh, an Indian restaurant, that with the local church and the local council provided over 5,000 meals a week for some eight to nine weeks, which I was just so impressed because it's someone's business and they just forgot about making any money and just leaned into helping their community. And the way they worked in a partnership with people of different faiths and of different political um, beliefs, I just thought was incredible. And it's that kind of work across London that I've really respected. In my own world, I, I, joined, I joined a big organization called the Felix Project, which provide food for food banks across London. 
And sometimes as a politician, you can do things for a photo call. And I made sure that I went back and continued to volunteer and went beyond just having my photo taken and what was good for me. I wanted to actually help the charity out. So on a personal level, I've enjoyed that. And of course, like most things, if you give people the time, you end up meeting really good people. So again, it, it, just on a personal level, it was great fun. Definitely. It sounds incredible. So let's go back to the very, very beginning then, if I may. You've mentioned about your army cadets. So can you tell us a little bit more about your childhood growing up in London? So you've mentioned, did you have youth opportunities like JLGB? You mentioned that you were an honorary colonel, in fact. So uh, why are Youth United organisations just so important to you? I think for me, I, look, I came from a very, very poor background. My mother and my brother and I, my mum's single mum, she struggled so financially. So having organised youth activities that were safe and that were broadening my horizons where they were just gold dust to, to me, to my mum, to us. And I came from an area where there was a fair amount of gang activity and it was getting worse and worse. And being part of the army cadets gave me somewhere else to be. It gave me other people and other life tactics to respect. And it just broadened my horizons. And one of the greatest things I did in army cadets was go to Arnhem, for instance, you know, to, to the Battle of the Bridge in Arnhem. And that, and that was, um, it was mind blowing for me as a poor kid from Labrick Road from West London. And that was mind blowing for me. And going through cadets, learning to map read, learning how to speak to people, learning how England worked was really, really, really important to me and is a very big part of the career I've gone on to have. And I'll say to young people watching this, there's two, there's two big elements in your future. One is your formal education. You know, you're at school, you get GCSEs, A-levels, et cetera, et cetera. But the other is your informal qualification. And the organisation that you're a part of now, and I still am with the Army Cadets, is just a wonderful way of, of learning things that you might learn elsewhere. And that's why for me, my mother, my family, Army Cadets was brilliant. And for me in particular, it's been a lifelong pursuit because even when I worked for the Prime Minister, I was a big part of spreading the Army Cadet Network through, through, throughout state schools. And I asked especially to be involved in that because I really, I really believe in the positive effect that uniform organisations can have on young people. Definitely. And I think we've got some questions later about the different activities and different things that JLGB as an organisation offer, such as uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's Award um, and NCS as well. Um, so in 2008, you were the subject of a BBC, Four, uh, BBC Radio 4 series, The House I Grew Up In, in which you said you'd been involved in burglary as a child. If you're happy to, you obviously don't have to. Can you tell us a bit more about that time in your life? What age were you and how these experiences shaped you to the man that you are today? Yeah, of course. I mean, that for me was a really, the, the programme was a really, it was a real thought point in my life because it's very rare that someone asks you, you know, what was your life? What were you doing? What do you think now? So that programme was great. It gave me perspective. And at the time I was very, very young and I'd witnessed a burglary. And quite frankly, where I'd come from, witnessing a burglary, <clears throat> excuse me, was the lower end of crime that you could witness. When I, when I was a bit older, I saw several people be stabbed, umpteen people being jumped and beaten up in the street, etc. So, so witnessing a burglary was, was, was pretty, pretty low, on, on, on the, certainly on the personal risk register. But what it did was show me that on, I needed to be elsewhere. I needed to separate myself from those people. And I want any, everybody listening to this to figure this out. Imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and thought you had to separate yourself from all of your friends. It's actually quite a big deal. It's much a bigger deal than you imagine. Imagine just going away and not speaking to anybody else that you dealt with. My mum was very good. She helped me do that. When I went to secondary school, I went to secondary school in Fulham, which was very far away from where I live. And I worked quite hard to change my group of friends. And it took a long time. But witnessing that burglary, witnessing people being stabbed, which was later on, I, I was older at that point because uh, the burglary, I was very young, I wasn't quite my teens, I don't think. But later on, again, made me realise that I needed to find much more positive places and more like-minded people. One of the great things about going to university, let's say, or being in a good school is that you're surrounded by like-minded people. And that's really, really important for your development. You know, if, 
if you and your friends are focused on, you know, I don't know, computer programming or, or physical fitness or something, that's, that's far more productive than if your friends are focused on crime. And I grew up in an environment where there was a fair amount of people who were focused on crime. Definitely. So from that, how did you then go on to get your first job um, and start out as a youth worker and then now on to become a government special advisor on youth and crime in particular? See, that's an interesting question. See, see I'm lucky. I, I, I'm, I'm one of the world's doers. I, I'm not happy unless I'm doing something. And that that emotion pushed me on to try and stretch myself. Like I'm, I was not content to sit in the house and read. I wanted to go out and meet people and do things. And what happened was my sister had been going to a um, to a summer scheme in, in John Kelly's school. And there were some boys there who were pretty unruly. And just in passing, she said to the guy who was running it, you should get my big brother up here. He could deal with them. And that and that very night he said to her, look, get your big brother up here. I need some help. So um, I went up there and I cannot tell you what a wonderful time I had. It, it was really my first job. I was probably just about 16. And my job basically in the morning was to come in very early in the morning, help open up the school and fold the trampoline. Because by that time I'd been doing gymnastics for some years. So I was a qualified trampoline coach. I'd unfold the trampoline, unfold the table tennis, make toast. We play table tennis for an hour and then we'd go on the trampoline. And, and I, I didn't realise at the time, but I was, I was a calming influence on the young people. I was having conversations with them. And, and it, it, was just, it was great fun. It, I cannot tell you, it was terrific fun just turning up, playing table tennis. And by the way, anybody watching, I'm very good at table tennis. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> you know I mean? and it, was, it was just great fun. And, and from there, from, I did that probably two summers in a row. And then my very best friend in the world, he was the best man at my wedding, a, a boy called Scott. Well, he's a man now, a man called Scott. His dad was a youth worker. And one day he said to me, this is many, many years later. He said to me, you should do, do youth work. You, you'll be good at it. So I, I volunteered for, for his project and, and it sort of built from there. And then many years later, I then worked for a thing called the Blenheim Drug Project, where I did all of their youth outreach. And then I went on to open up my own charity because I, I believe in the agency of young people. I think if you can inspire a young person, they can go on and just do marvellous things. And some of the work I was doing for the council and other people was too focused on their problems. And I wanted to focus on their future. So I set up on my own. Definitely. I mean, one of those messages there about the power of young people, I think, has been reiterated over and over again on Jail Should Be Virtual from many guests um, that have been involved in social work and the young people um, about the power that we have to change things. Um, and as a student currently studying psychology, in particular forensic psychology, um, I've become fascinated with um, crime and how the police deal with crime. And I also noticed that you have big plans for the police force um, if you can get to the uh, to become the mayor of London. So can you tell just a really, really quick summary of what you plan to do with the police force? Because um, it sounds incredible. What, what I really want to focus on is the safety of Londoners. Whatever you want to do, anybody watching this now, if you want to be a forensic scientist, I, I don't know, a psychologist, a chemist, a, a businessman, a businesswoman, whatever, what you need is to be safe number one priority in London is to be safe and that's why I want to do it so on one end I want to give the police force the man and the woman power to follow up criminals what's driving crime in London is the fact that they're not being pursued so you commit a crime and you get away with it and then what happens is you go back to other criminals tell them about your success and then they join you and the, and the group grows and grows and grows and currently in London we've got a real trend toward growing crime we've had record years for for knife crime and for homicide etc in order to turn that round, we need the man and the woman power, boots on the ground to deal with that. But we cannot only arrest our way out of this problem. We need to give young people the space to, to develop. So two things I'll be doing. One is taking some of the adult education budget. We have an adult education budget in London. I want to shave off a bit of that and build what I call a second chance fund. And that's for those young people who didn't do anything in school, are not at college and have no employment skills. And I want to give them the training so they have something to offer in the employment market so they can get a job and they can move on and become productive. And on the lower age range, I'm going to set up at least one youth zone in every borough. And I'll just keep going two, three, four, if I'm lucky enough to get elected again and again and again. 
And why I want to do that is in conjunction with a charity called Onside. And I want you to imagine your school building, a modern school building with all the opportunities and none of the formal lessons. It's about informal, important social development for you. Because one of the things that young people are often not aware of, but they're doing is developing socially. And that's because of the interactions you're having, you're at university, you're working for your local community. And I want to boost that for children who are who don't have an organization like yours, for instance, to join, who don't have the army cadets, who don't have a gymnastics team. I say gymnastics, I did gymnastics for a very long time when I was young. And it's just about making sure that young people have a safe place to hang out, meet cool people, be, and just be inspired and move on. And, and that's why I'll be doing those two things. Definitely. I mean, I think, I mean, I did gymnastics as well. I didn't do it for very long. Wasn't very good at it, but I definitely did some gymnastics earlier. But I also I did think- it for 22 years. I hung in there. <laughs> I think I did it maybe three or four years. I think I won one trophy and I quit when I was at the top of my game. Um, Leave but... wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, like you mentioned about army cadets and giving young people those opportunities, we know that you've engaged with the Jewish community previously on over many years, including trips to Israel mm -hmm. and to of some concentration camps in Poland. Why was it important for you to go on these experiences and what lessons did you bring back um, when it came to working with the London Jewish community? I, I'd say three things. I think firstly, I go back to my personal need to do things, to go and experience. You, you can sit me in a room and explain something to me and my intellect can get hold of it. But when I went to Auschwitz, for instance, my emotional self got hold of it. I, I, I had studied in school. People had, had told, told me about the Holocaust. I'd attended services in my day job as a London Assembly member none of those things got across to me the sheer scale of what went on. When I saw it, I mean, I just have to use the words unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me. And I remember going to Yad Vashem and seeing this, there's lots of exhibits in there, but there was one in particular that, that emotionally touched me because I have young children and they were even younger then. And there was one of a suitcase that had a letter in it and some baby shoes. And that brought home to me the, the very human and and intimate scale of, of what had been done because when, when you go to Auschwitz it's horrifically factory-like it's terrible and, and like for instance I don't like to hear the words German German efficiency anymore because of the experience I had there but when I went to Yad Vashem that brought it home on a personal level you know to, to be helpless, helpless to be unable to help your own family would be a really desperate feeling and I think that that experience, those two experiences were important to me because it meant when I came home and people were talking about a rise in anti-Semitic attacks, I understood it. I understood how, how it's personally um, damaging to people because I had a different reference point. But having said that as well, when I went to Israel, it gave me another perspective. So can, I, I didn't want to only look at the Jewish community as being under pressure, as being victims. It's important when I went to Israel because I saw such levels of innovation. And for those of you that know me, my degree is in engineering. I love anything technical. I build gliders and radio control cars and Lego and all that nonsense. I love it. And when I went to Israel, I met some of the most tech savvy, go ahead business people I'd ever met. And it was great because it gave me a contrast in, in the fortunes of the Jewish community. And, and I needed that, that full scope in order to be able to come back to London and, and work with and help the Jewish community. I, for me, it was very important. And just, just on a personal level, I mean, it's expansive to your mind. And, and I, obviously I come, it's, obvious, it's obvious I come from the black community, you know, it, it's obvious. <laughs> but we have had our own troubles across the years, you know, historically over probably 400 years now. And to compare the two and, and, and learn for my community, some of the response the Jewish community had to the Holocaust is important because it's meant I've told different stories to my community and, and, and pushed for different things because I've seen how the Jewish community has made certain things work. Definitely. And I mean, some of the students, uh, some of the young people that are watching this right now, either on our call or who will watch it in the future, we had the opportunity and some of us will get the opportunity to go to Israel um, as part of JLGB, we offer that. And going to Yad Vashem, like you said, uh, my Israeli tour leader obviously has an emotional connection to somebody who had passed away and was buried at Yad Vashem. And it's just one of those places that like, you can't believe, really. And then 
I would say that uh, unfortunately due to COVID, my year and so I think maybe the year below or the year above, we haven't had the opportunity to go to Poland as we'd have liked to. Um, so some of us haven't had that experience at Auschwitz, but hearing your opinion on it has been absolutely incredible. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and then just before we move on to some audience questions, because you've heard my voice for a very long time now, <laughs> before we move to the audience, um, perhaps probably one of the most important questions, why do you want to be the mayor of London? Wow. I mean, that's the big question, isn't it? So it's strange to wake up one morning and decide I should be the mayor of London. And, and what I'm going to do is extract some of the politics. Right? I, I don't want to bore you with, with party politics, but I think London is on the wrong path. It's on the wrong trajectory. And I've seen that happening for some time now. And London is actually the greatest city in the world. That's an actual fact. But if we're going to maintain that, I think we need to change directions. London needs a fresh start. And if I was to give it titles, I'd say things like housing, most of the young people on this call now will struggle with housing unless someone like me gets to be mayor and changes the direction we're moving. Public safety, London is more dangerous than it's been ever. And, and it's not my opinion. We, we've had two record years in a row for homicide. We've had a raise in gun crime through lockdown and that trend has to be bucked. And my backstory of coming from a very poor community, full of crime, but being able to steer thousands of young people away from crime means that I understand where crime comes from and what we need to do in London to make London safe. And thirdly, I believe in the power of Londoners. This city has worked for over 1500 years because of the creativity, the wealth generation and the generosity of Londoners. And what I want to do is unleash that. You know, I, when you come from a poor community, people regularly tell you that somebody else is responsible for your future. And what that does is mean you have no future. As a young person now, the, the one thing I will tell you is you're not great because you're young. You're great because you have potential. And the only way to realize that greatness is for you to take a step forward. Your potential is only realized when you make that step. I cannot make you great. I can provide the, the, the space for you to be great, but you have to be the, the, the driver of your own greatness. Success comes from within largely. And if you don't believe that of, of a person and of a city, then, then that whole city and everybody in it is in trouble. And you've seen things around the cost of transport, the cost of housing, the amount of crime, the pollution in London. All of these problems can be, can be solved as long as we get fresh leadership in London. Definitely. And you mentioned about homelessness. And I would say that one of the most powerful videos that I saw on your Instagram was about when you were going to university and you didn't have a stable place to live. So is that one of those things that have powered you to um, to have that kind of goal if you got the mayor of London? I mean, I, I was homeless basically all the way through my 20s. I did a lot of sofa surfing, staying at people's houses a few times. I got very close to sleeping rough. I cannot tell you how horrific that feels. It's really horrible. And now that I'm, you know, 20 years later and, and have a family and a place to live, I regularly remind myself of that fact because I use it to motivate myself to do more for Londoners. You know, I, I, I wake up every day and think, what can I do next to help Londoners out? And when you ask about a random act of kindness, I've tried to structure my, my, my professional life to, to put me in that position regularly. So for instance, I ran a youth charity that I started. I ran a 60 plus day center for years as a chair of the trustees. I'm on the London assembly. And a lot of it is driven by the experiences I've had. And on one end is to prevent people having the experiences I've had. So I've been homeless and I've been unemployed. And there were two very hard times. I had to work my entire way through university, which I would argue is just, you know, coming up to zero. I was in a minor situation and I came up to zero. And powering away from university I've had very positive experiences as well I've been elected to London Assembly I met my wife in London I have two children I have a home and I want everybody to have more of my positive experience and less of my negative experience mm. because your mental health and just the comfort you can have in your life if, if politicians if politics gets it right it really really increases your chance of living a fruitful life yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So you've heard a lot of my voice. Um, we're going to jump to the audience. Um, so first up, we have a question from Hannah. Hi, I know Hi, you're Hannah. looking to make London a greener city with amazing representatives like Greta Thunberg leading the way. What are your plans to tackle climate change within London? And do you have any plans to incorporate the voices of young activists if you're elected for mayor? 
Okay, let's separate them out. Let's talk about climate change. When I talked earlier about London going in the wrong direction, one of the things we're doing with climate change, we're just taxing people. So we will increase the congestion charge, we'll make it out a London driving tax. None of those things clean the air. My concept for it is to take the source of that dirty air away. So I will make the entire bus fleet green by 2025. And that's the equivalent of removing a million cars from the roads of London. That's how you clean the air. The other piece as well, I will give interest free loans to the black cab industry, because remember, there's 24,000 black cabs in London who do 100,000 miles a year, really big mileage, so they can move more quickly to the electric cab, again, minimising the actual pollutants that are pushed out, out into the air. The other big piece as well is we it's called plant. So on any building site across London, the mayor of London can't tell them what they can do with their machines but I've come up with a way of asking them to use biodiesel in order to be pumping less rubbish into the environment. And that's the clean up piece. The, the environment to me is more than that. The environment is about how do we live? What's public realm like? Where can you go and play in the park? So the second piece is London, about 48% of London's land area is green, especially around the edges, but there's big tracks of it that we can't use. So I will cle be cleaning up and opening up the green belt so there's just more green space for people to go out and, in, and, and just use, you know, walk the dog, have a picnic with your family, just that open space to use. I think that's important. The other piece as well going forward in the future is how do we build in London? Now it's a combination of central government rules and what I can ask for people to do under planning permission as well. And I want to support the government in this idea that we remove ice engines as, as internal combustion engines and replace them with something else. The other piece is to have more bike clubs, I'm sorry, car clubs. So you know the way that we use Boris bikes, you can jump on one, right? We need to do that with cars because for every one car club car there is, it removes 13 privately owned cars off the road. And I think that will reduce congestion because what I want to get to is that many more parts of London are pedestrianised, at least at the weekend. So can you imagine a situation where your local high street on Friday night, the barriers go up, the chairs come out, people can sit in the road, they go down on Sunday night and they can use the road to do work you know, Monday to Friday. I think we could do that in many more parts of London, but we have to get all the other things I explained correct first. Thank you, Hannah, for your question. Um, and next we have Emily. Hi there. Hi. Um, so as a young person, we're often known as the renter generation. And, and the thought of moving out from our parents' home and buying a property, especially in London, seems almost impossible. So what do you have, um, what plans have you got for your cam campaign to make it more achievable? Thank you for the question, because I think that's one of London's chronic perennial problems. So the first thing I'll say is I will always build a large amount of social housing. Um, I, I come from social housing. I understand the power of it. But the challenge London has had, because it's only built social housing, it's done two things. It hasn't built enough social housing. That's dragged even more people into needing it. And we haven't provided housing for people who have big housing need, but are not eligible for social housing. So that's a start point. That's a problem. My solution is 100,000 homes for £100,000. And what that means is you as a young person will be able to buy a portion of a home, 10%, 20%, 30% of that home. And then you be able to go at 1% increments or stay right where you are. But it does two important things. One, it allows you to build some equity. So imagine you own 20% of that home. When that home sold, you will get 20% of the profit. And you can take that profit and you know, buy another home, deposit for something else. And also importantly, if you're renting, your rent will be cheaper than someone paying this, the full rent on an equivalent property. And the reason I want to do that is lowering rent costs in London means that people can have a much better standard of living. Because at this point, some Londoners spend two thirds of their income on rent, which is ridiculous. We need to reduce that. And one of the things that will stop London being the competitive place it is, is if it's too expensive to live. So that's why I'm focusing on 100,000 homes for 100,000 pounds. And the reason I'm doing that as well is because we, we already have the money to do it. So the government has given us six billion pounds to spend on affordable homes in London. And that's how I'll pay for it. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And next up, we have a question from Sydney. Hiya. Hi. 
Um, so if not for GIGB and its kosher and Sabbath friendly provisions for everyday youth activities, many young people from faith and cultural backgrounds would be accidentally excluded from taking on an active role in British society. So be that weekly GIGB groups, Duke of Edinburgh's award or the National Citizen Service, NCS. Um, do you think barriers of participation and the need for targeted services are really understood by assembly members and government to ensure trusted youth and charity services? That's a great question. The short answer is no. Um, but the, the good news is I think they will, they will quite happily learn and help. And, and I'll, I'll give you a story. So when I ran my, my charity, I'm a card carrying Christian in the aisle with my tambourines, you know, clapping along and singing songs. And it sometimes meant that I only saw the world in that way. But I grew up in a very big Muslim community. So when I set up my charity, I'd say 60 to 70 percent of my of my clients were Muslim. And it was a very it, I had to learn an awful lot very quickly in order to be relevant to them. So, for instance, I had to put on a girls group, which had never crossed my mind before. I had to have halal meat if we, if we were going to do anything um, with food involved. And all of these things were learnings for me. Mm -hmm. So when you say accidentally exclude people, you are 100 percent correct. But what we need is a willingness to learn and make the change. And that means organisations like yours end up acting on behalf of communities far beyond your own because you make that an issue. You make it something that people are aware of and discuss. Because my whole time running the charity, when I dealt with a council, when I dealt with other charities and schools, they always wanted to help, but they just didn't know that they needed to help. So I believe if people are, are, are if it's explained to people, they normally are quite happy to help, but you're correct. There, there's, there's, there's some teaching there. There's some lessons to be learned. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. So one more quick one from me then. Um, with the pandemic causing people to work from home, it's left central London pretty pretty sparse. There's not many people around. And when these restrictions finally end, do you think that that lifestyle, the commuter lifestyle, is going to return? Like, how likely do you think it is that London will be the city it was before, the vibrant, busy city that it was this time last year? Will there be more of a half the time spent at home, half the time working in an actual office. What, what, what do you see the future of London um, work-wise being? My first response to that is I really hope it isn't as you've explained. Let's be clear, London works because of what they call an agglomeration effect. So we're all together. We have the single biggest well-educated um, workforce in the world. There is as many people in London, for instance, working in tech as there is in California. But the difference is in London, you can walk across the road and meet the people who do your PR or do your legal. And that's how business has worked in London for 1500 years. So if we don't return to a very, very full and packed London, it will have a detrimental effect to the entire economic outlook of the whole country. That's the first part. The second part is this, there will absolutely be a change. But I think that change could also be positive. So for instance, I'm a person who travels into London five days a week, you know, Monday to Friday, bang into the office. And I've had to build my whole life to be close enough to the center of London to do that. But people who are coming to London maybe three days a week may be prepared to travel from even further away because they're not making a journey as regularly. And the reason I say that, because actually it could increase the amount of people who use central London. And that will be very important because as much as our local areas are very um, important to us and, and we want those to thrive, could you imagine your local area supporting um, the Royal Opera House or I don't know, the V&A Museum? Definitely not. You need millions of people to make organizations like that viable. And the other most important thing in London is, in an ordinary year, we would have 22 million foreign visitors. Think that through for a second. That's an enormous sum of people. They will only come here if London is firing in all cylinders. We need those people to come here because all of our industries from, you know, barbers, coffee shops, right up to, to fintech, to, 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 to hotels need that footfall. So in short, London will change. I think it will change for the better. And in the short term, there will be a shock. There will, London will be emptier in the center than it, has, than it normally is. But the quicker we, turn, we return to the normal figure, the better for us all. Well, hopefully we will see that very, very soon and we can all return to what normal used to be. Um, so we've got a couple more questions now from the audience again. Um, this time we have another one from a different Sydney. 
Hi. Hi. Um, so looking to my future and many other young people, what are your plans to increase the future job market? There is currently an oversaturation of young people looking for entry level positions. So how do you hope to combat this? That's a great question. It's one I think about all the time. So if you look at the, the, the past of London, where, where, where we have moved forward is because we've been at the front of innovation. So innovation in banking, in insurance, very lately in fintech, that's financial technology. We now need to make sure we keep our traditional industries big and strong because those industries make other industries possible. For instance, the fact that we have so many bankers and financiers in London means that our legal, um, our legal business is very big. So we need to keep all of those things going, but also we need to add new ones. And I think the two big new ones on the horizon are health technology. So if you look what's happening in King's Cross, um, there's a great agglomeration that means they're coming together of lots of big um, health businesses and that's creating lots of employment for young people. What I would be doing as mayor is increasing our funding to that place by about 500% by five times because I think there's a real future and if Covid has taught us anything it's something that the Britain is a world leader in let's capitalize on that and develop all the health technologies that the world's going to need going forward. The marketplace is big it's almost seven billion people you know, health is important to every living being. So let's do something about that. I think we can do the same with, with, with sort of straight up computer technology. Um, there is no sign that the importance of computers and programming and all of the networking and, and associated business, businesses around that, there's no sign that that's gonna go away in importance. So again, that's an industry that we should have here and grow. And there's another industry that I think is often overlooked and that's the education industry. We have some of the best education industry, um, sorry, institutions in the world. And I think they should spend more of their time thinking of how they can commercialize their activities. And I say that because if we can, if we can expose more young people around the world, particularly girls in the third world, to the levels of education we take for granted here, we would be doing something significant for the human race. And I think, I think the rest of the world would be interested in that. And that's another industry we should be looking to grow because again, it will provide employment for young people. Thank you, Sydney. Um, and the next question we have is from Marcy. Hi, so last week was Children's Mental Health Week. I'm in school clothes, not knowing about exams and not knowing if we will have holidays or even our GLGB summer camp in August. This has had a serious toll on many people's, pe many people's mental health. Do you think enough focus is being given to young people and their mental health at this time? And what's your plan to try and help? So the answer to that is yes and no. So the yes part is, of course, for instance, my 13 year old daughter is sat upstairs and every day I'm thinking, how can I help her with her schoolwork? How can I make it more interesting? How can I get her out of the house to make sure she gets some exercise, blah, 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 blah. So, so families and individuals are focused on their mental health because you, you can't escape your own mental health. I think as a nation, we didn't quite understand the impact that lockdown would have on locked people. In fact, all people, we, we didn't quite understand that. And I, I think we're going to have to work harder about mental health. But my wider piece on mental health, because of course, as someone who used to work on a drug program and work with young people, mental health has always been in the forefront of my mind. I wish we talked more about mental well-being, because we often talk about mental health once your mental health has gone wrong. What we should be concentrating on as a, as a nation is how do we preserve, how do we protect, how do we boost people's ongoing mental well-being. Now, there's certain things in your life that you take for granted that if you stand back and look at them, they're very, very powerful for your mental health. So relationships in your family, you've just mentioned going to school, knowing who your exams are. If we could make more people aware, particularly young people of their mental health and the triage around that, they could help, they could then develop personal um, strategies to keep their mental health in a better place. Now, because I believe those things, that is something that I will be building at City Hall. So on one very small level, it's just about having the Mayor of London's portal, having a very big and very obvious mental health information um, section. The other piece as well is using some of the, so for instance, we have police officers in schools around London. We should be talking to them about mental health because if you, if you live in a community that suffers from a lot of, lot of crime, 
that very, very much affects your mental health. I've been speaking to young people in Croydon, a few in Shepherd's Bush as well, who are quite frankly traumatized um, because of the, the level of crime they've been witness to. And I think if police, if teachers, if their parents had a better idea of how to help them deal with their mental health, everybody's mental health could move up a level. And I think that would be very important. To use the word happiness sometimes sounds trite, but you will know if you feel happy, the whole world is a much better place. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marcy. Um, and I think the one thing that I think a lot of people have picked up on is the government are trying to do something about mental health with the appointment of Dr. Alex about um, becoming the ambassador for mental health. So that's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, we have another question to you from Maya. Hi, Sean. Hi, Maya. Um, so in a recent interview with David Williams, you spoke about the Conservatives being a party of the working class people. This might be more how people traditionally, sorry, traditionally saw the Labour Party. So could you explain a little what you meant by this? And do you think a Conservative can be a mayor, a mayor again in a city that voted Labour in the last general election? So a great question. I, I, that's a very great question. I get asked this a lot. Why have you said it, Sean? So here's, here's the statistics on it. We have had many more Conservative governments in, in Britain than we've had Labour governments. And in order for any government to win in a general election, working class people have to vote for that government. It's just a statistical fact. You, you couldn't win. You couldn't win, and particularly in the past. You just couldn't win without working class people. So I think I'm very right when I say it is working class people who vote Conservative. If you look at the last election, London voted Conservative. But of course, London has many, many more middle class people than most other places in the country. Um, the famous Red Wall that was smashed absolutely a working class vote. So that's where I'm coming from when I, when I say that. The other deeper thing is, if you um, show people 10 policies from the Labour Party, 10 policies from the Conservative Party without the label, the Conservative policies win every time. Where the Labour Party, and, and, and I don't say this as a slight, I say it with respect, they've been very good at two things. One is getting, ac getting across the emotional part of politics. And for that, I respect them because it's very easy to say the economy, the economy, economy. Of course, the economy is important, but actually it's jobs, jobs, jobs. That's what people really care about. If I say to you, we've just raised the economy by 10 billion pounds, you don't care. You didn't get any of the 10 billion pounds. But if I say to you, your neighbors have gotten a job or I've been able to save somebody else's employment, you, you, you respect that, you understand that. And I think the Labour Party have been very good at it. The bit that I think the Conservative Party need to take charge of, our PR is done by the Labour Party. If you see any Labour politician, they spend their time speaking about us. We spend our time speaking about policy. You know, we, we, we will talk about, you know, why it's the right thing for the country. They will talk about what the Conservatives have done wrong. That's what that's what they'll do. And I think that's made a profound difference to how people view us. One of the most interesting things about being in the Conservative Party, particularly as an elected member, when you knock on doors, what people say to you about the Conservative Party doesn't feel anything like the party that you're in. You know, like somebody said to me, for instance, you know, you're a token black man. You know, they made you the candidate. No, they didn't. It was Conservative members who voted for me and they had a choice. The other two people was a white lady and a white man. So if, if they didn't like the black man, they had somewhere else to, you know, to vote for. And when I told that to that individual, they were shocked because they thought I'd been put in by Boris Johnson. No, I was put in by the members in London. So when I say these things, I'm convinced and I believe them. But the beauty of our democracy, you could be working class and vote for whoever you like. And that's the bit that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And our final audience question is from Simone. Hi. Hi. Um, so we've seen smear campaigns used in elections in other countries in recent months, spreading fake facts and polarizing the electorate. How are you looking to prevent these divisive techniques in your campaign? And with social media used now by so many to impact imp opinion, do you think it is possible to keep these trends out of British politics? Oh, wow, mm -hmm. I mean, that is the biggie, isn't it? So fake news, I, 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 it's here, it's too late, it's here. So to keep it out of British politics would mean you'd have to reverse it. Now, of course, I'm going to tell you I don't do things like that. And I, I truly believe it when I say it. 
But when you run a, a campaign as large as mine or as large as Steve Khan's, there's hundreds of people putting out information on your behalf. So the odd thing might get through. But it's incumbent on myself and Sadiq Khan not to do it and, and to make it quite clear to our teams we don't want it done. But of course, there's a third player, the press, and then there's a fourth player, the public, which we have no control over at all. Even this week, I read something about me in the newspaper, which remained nameless. That simply isn't true. And there's very little I can do about it. And as a politician, you just have to hope that people do two things. One, get their information from more than one source. So, for instance, if you are watching this now and, you, and you're and a mirror reader, also buy the Daily Telegraph. If you read the Times, also buy the Independent. You know, give yourself a broad spread of information because what happens is probably even more powerful than fake news. Because when fake news is ridiculous, you'll spot it and reject it. What, what's really powerful is when a publication that you respect keeps feeding you only one line because you immediately take it on as a truth. And that happens an awful lot in our press. So I think it's a real problem. But if you want to go a step deeper, where we saw the most damaging fake news recently is around the COVID outbreak. So, for instance, at the very beginning of the outbreak, people were sending messages around the black community telling black people that they are immune to COVID. Now, that might sound ridiculous now, but at the beginning when nobody knew anything about it, certain people believed that, and that cost people their lives. The, the fake news floating around the black community got so bad that a number of people I know believe it was a deliberate attack on black people. That's when you realize that fake news has real power. So if that's what's happening now, imagine the onslaught that your generation is gonna face with you know, just more fake news and it getting more and more sophisticated. Because the thing that really makes me panic for the future is deep fakes. I don't know if any of you know what it is, but with computer technology, you can, you can get a face that looks exactly like mine and put any word you like in its mouth. That's a real worry. So the trend around fake news is terrible. It could get worse. And I think at some point the law might have to intervene. I, 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 think, I think that's probably gonna happen. The law is gonna have to intervene because you can't let fake mo um, news destroy our democracies. Thank you, Simone. Um, so back to me just for a few more questions. Um, the London elections for mayor were delayed by an entire year due to the pandemic and voting for the London mayor will now take place in just a few months on the 6th of May. With many restrictions likely to still be in place, do you know what plans there are to ensure that Londoners can vote safely? That's a good question because that goes right to the core of our democracy, can people vote? So as with all elections, there's a postal vote and postal votes now are being put out in numbers that, that, that traditionally they probably wouldn't have been, so much higher rate. And also people are going to be able to register for a postal vote far later than normal. That is good on one hand, but I'm very worried about it on another because it does mean that voter fraud is, is, is much more likely and will be easier to commit. And as a country, traditionally, we've been being been quite relaxed about voter fraud and I think that could be a real problem here in London at that time because of course a, a London election is a very big one the electorate it's about five million people it basically it's the second biggest election in the country after the general election so it's hard to administer so I'm, I'm worried about that but it will be a test case to see how we go along on in the future but I still favour the old-fashioned democratic way of people having to turn up and people having to prove who they are Recently, the government changed the rules around regular reg registration and lots of people, particularly on the left, complained about that. I think it's the right thing to do because voter fraud is a corruption to democracy and a democracy that's corrupt then has many, many problems down the line. We must keep sacred the fact that our democracy is fair. Definitely. So the first of my final questions, you've been absolutely incredible this afternoon. The first of my final questions we always ask all of our guests the same. These are unprecedented times. The physical, mental health, economic and environmental impacts may yet affect us all for some time to come. But do you have hope for the future? What positives do you think are going to come out of the strange time that we're all living in now that we've been in for 11 months or so? I think there's three things I'd say. I have my perennial um, positive that I'll do at the end, but I think we've developed technology to make meeting people, to make moving around better. And when I mean moving around, I'm talking about virtually. Now we're in a meeting now, 250 or thousand people could see this and the environmental impact of it will be very, very low. 
I think I think that's good. I, I really do I think that's good. The other thing where I'm positive is as well. London has still has all the things that make a successful city. They're just sitting there waiting to be reignited. And so I, I, I think London is, is one of the best place cities in the world to bounce back. It will take effort, it'll take time, but I think we can do that. And third is the people of London. The greatest asset this place has and has always had is the people here. Young people like you who are studying, planning for the future, old people like me who are trying to make the place work right here, right now. The people of London are the single greatest asset it has ever had. Earlier on, I pointed out we have the biggest well-educated workforce in the world and the pandemic hasn't been able to take that away. So I think London's best days are still ahead of it because we are, we are hustlers. We are, we are hustlers in the world. We want to make it work. Well, let's hope we can get back to that very, very soon and we can kickstart all of those things that are just waiting for us to get back to. So finally, our big final question. We always ask our guest to nominate or ask another celebrity or community leader to be a future guest on our programme and help entertain all the children and young people stuck at home that have been watching all of our interviews for the past 46 weeks. So if you have enjoyed this afternoon's interview, we really, really hope that you have done. Is there anyone that you might be able to ask to join us? Who would you like to nominate? We've got Sadiq Khan coming on in a few weeks. So is there anyone else that you, you would like to nominate you think would do a good job on our virtual program? Let me think. I think first and foremost, I won't nominate another politician. Let's, let's not do that. Um, David Williams. They are. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of, Let me tell you why. When I, he interviewed me recently for GQ. And I had a picture in my head of, of who he was going to be and how he was going to be completely different. He is a lovely, charming, kind man. He asked tough questions in a kind way. He, he was funny, he was entertaining and he was warm. And after we went away and we, and we, and, you know, we did our interview, we went away, it's in a, it was in the magazine. Everybody decided it was a success. He sent me a note to say thank you, which is extraordinary because he did me a favor, I didn't do him a favor. And he also sent my children a signed copy of his books. So we're reading Gangster Granny, which is great. And I mean, I, I could, he could, from my point of view, a person couldn't come more highly recommended. He'll be great. I think if you can help us, if you can send and shoot him a message for us, I think that would be absolutely it done. I know that we've got people here that have read his books. Personally, I've read some of his books as well. And I think that he would be an absolute incredible person. We've all seen what he's like on something like Britain's Got Talent. But I think, like you said, more down to earth, more personal in an interview. He might be he's just even more fun. So, yeah, hopefully we can see him on in a few weeks. Um, thank you very much, Sean. We cannot thank you enough simply for joining us this afternoon and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Your mindset, your outlook on life has been truly inspirational. We've enjoyed hearing about your career, your childhood, as well as your hopes and dreams for London should you be elected as mayor. On behalf of all the children, the young people, the families that are watching this either now or in the future, thank you once again for joining us. We wish you well, good luck with your campaign. Um, please stay safe, take care, and we very much hope to see you soon. Thank you for having me. I've really had a good time. Thanks. No worries. And that is it, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Gerald Be Virtual. That was Sean Bailey, the Conservative candidate in the London Mayor elections. In a few weeks' time, we hope to put your questions to London Mayor Sadiq Khan too, so be sure to watch out for that. Whether you've been watching live or catching up in your own time at Gerald Be HQ, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube or Instagram, or even via our website, jlgb.org forward slash virtual, please take a moment right now to like, subscribe and to share this episode on whatever platform you're on so we can reach out and share some positivity with as many children, young people and families as possible all over the world. And if you are able to, why not consider making a donation at www.jlgb.org forward slash donate. We will be back next Thursday at the usual time in the evening with another incredible guest on JLGB Virtual. One for all of those sports fans out there. We will be joined by British rower and Olympic gold medalist Johnny Surler. You won't want to miss that. Until then, stay safe, keep well, have a great week and good night, everybody. <laughs>